I've been wanting to go over this book for a long, long time, and it just never seemed to get to it, so better late than never. This is still, from what I understand, one of the all-time best-selling Marvel titles. This is X-Men number one from October of 1991. This gave us the team of Chris Claremont and Jim Lee. And every time I go back to this book, I just remember how great we had it during this time period. Now, from what I understand is when Claremont got into this book, it was sort of a... He still wanted to bring to fruition a lot of the stuff that he was working on in the Uncanny X-Men books, which kills me that they took him off of Uncanny. I don't know the whole story of why they gave him this particular title. If you guys could fill me in down in the comments, I really would appreciate it. Now, it kind of starts off very action-packed. We get these mutants, essentially, that have escaped from Russia, still in a shuttle, and then they have the military coming after them, and they're trying to reach Asteroid M to seek safe asylum. And when the battle starts to just become unhinged, in walks the master of magnetism. And we get this gorgeous two-page splash. And it's just, mm. Now, before we dive into it, let's talk about who made Rubicon. This is Chris Claremont writing and Jim Lee co-plotter and penciler. Scott Williams, Inc., Tom Orzanowski doing the lettering. Joe Rosas doing the colors. Suzanne Gaffney, assistant editor, Bob Harris, editor, and Tom DeFalco, editor-in-chief. A lot of big names for the time on this book. And as this, as I was just talking about, this powder keg of this battle happens, ugh, I am Magneto. This is my home. I am rapidly losing interest in whatever you choose to do on the Earth's surface. Despoil the environment. Slaughter yourselves to the last child. I no longer care. But I refuse to allow you to extort your penchant for violence to my very doorstep. Ha! That's how you intro a book. And you can kind of see how Magneto is not exactly wanting to be a pacifist, but he's not exactly the Magneto from we know from way back in the early 60s when he was first introduced as just a straight-up villain. And this is where we learn that the mutants want asylum from Magneto. You can't just leave us to die. Did I give that impression? Such is not my intention, since it would merely provoke inevitable, ever-escalating retaliation. I shall simply return you all to the surface to convey my warning that next time I shall not be so charitable. No! I beg your pardon. You can't send us back. It's you we came to find. Lord Magneto, we're mutants like you. We've come to serve to pledge our lives to your glorious cause. Those days are gone. In mercy's name, your people need you now more than ever. Can you abandon them? Can you deny your destiny? I miss comic writing like this and then the art team here just to give that mag magneto just that moment of inflection thought which leads us into the main plot i like that they kind of give up this file of when they, he was on trial i think it was what, uncanny x-men 200 and they're talking about how asteroid m is essentially sitting over russian space nick fury is seeing this powder cage just escalating he goes, if the Soviets uh, act like, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not having enough coffee today. If the Soviets act like hotheads, Mr. President, they can make things worse. And so Fury says, I have another way. And oh, look at this, another friggin' splash page. Mm, love it. And it just goes through and introduces all the X-Men once again. And what's happening here is everyone is exercising. Like, this is kind of where the team has finally come back together after being scattered for so many years. And I love how there's this moment between Gene and Xavier. Just like old times. What's the saying, Gene? I can't speak French, so don't expect me to even try to say that. But it basically breaks down to the more things change, the more they stay the same. So much has changed since I was last in this mansion. And taking an active role in the leadership 
of the X-Men, including myself, it's almost as though we're all coming together for the first time. We seem to be at each other's throats now more than ever. The differences between us sharpening to a killing edge with some of the children entrusted to my care, buried. So talking about at this point in this photo, that would be Warlock and uh, Doug Ramsey. And of course, Karma, Karma <coughs> went off on her own to try to help to find her family from her corrupted uncle in Madripoor. And Xavier says, I keep wondering, had I never left, could I have somehow prevented this from happening? You did what you thought was best, Charles. And of course, Jean always being the voice of reason. And it just kind of establishes what this book is about, bringing all these different arcs from the 10 year plus that Xavier, uh, Xavier Claremont was on the book. The teams are split up in the, t in the two, trying to infiltrate the mansion, testing out all the defenses. And I just love the artwork here, especially this one. This is one of those classic ones where Archangel's essentially using Colossus as a wrecking ball. And Beast, the real Beast, not the craptastic Krakulan era of Beast. For what it's worth, oh fearless leader, given Archangel's speed and Colossus's mass... Our armored Russian comrade will make a fairly impressive wrecking ball. Probably demolish the mansion all by himself. That's a physical power, Hank. How's that going to help him against Gene's psychic telepathic attack? So you just see how Scott, even though, again, he's always the hated one, why he is the leader. Best that he can be in cool under pressure. And then, of course, the juxtaposition to that the renegades because betsy at this point kind of has that death wish after being one with uh of course i get quinon there's the name but if you remember when we went back over what was it 268 and betsy was talking about how she is saying how being in this new body she feels like she's herself for the first time and how just being under logan's tutelage and in madripoor with jubilee she learned how she's more rowdy than she used to be and of course the raging cajun led by wolverine and they're going underground. And try as they may as a team. Gambit, of course, gets too self-confident. -con uh, bringing his assault to an end. But, of course, it's the Weapon X. <laughs> the Knucklehead. Hyatchuk. Your robot duplicates fooled the Cajun. Not me. I know you're sent too well. Bang, Charlie. You're dead. Back off, Wolverine. You made your point. Are you nuts or what? You know how dangerous those adamantium claws of yours are? A wave of your arm could slice him through solid steel. One slip just now. And I love the look they gave Xavier here. Just like, um, what's going on? It's very much akin to the Barry Windsor Smith Marvel Presents Weapon X when he uh, rips through the controls to get to Cornelius and all of the lab techs. Just very akin to that. And just the way he's battle-hardened and the way him and Betsy are able to work together. <sighs> and the plot happens. Fury reaches out. And, of course, I love these. What do you call them? Pinups that we get in the book. Gorgeous. But anyway, we get back to Magneto on Asteroid M. Basically saying that both of these people that he saved, the Russian soldiers and the mutants shall abide by his rules of hospitality. Have your subordinate lower his arm. You heard Lord Magneto flat scan. Unhand your better. We come seek in sanctuary, my lord. We place ourselves under your protection. Like heck you will. Deke, don't. Something happens. She goes, and pledge our lives to your cause. Eric, covered in blood. But... I have no more cause. Oh. That's why I get so tired of people saying, oh, comics are funny magazines. Yes, there's a time and a place for funny mags, but there's a lot of these comics that people back then and still to this day don't give it the proper respect. I mean, yes, it's superheroes, yada, 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 but it reads, like, especially this, and people don't actually know how to write. It feels like you're reading novel close to something Shakespearean and I just miss that a lot of 
this type of talent is gone in modern books. I mean, yes, we have good writers, but not on this level that we got from the latter half of the Golden Age and up. Yes, they were bad writers, but there was better... If you go back, and especially some of the books that I've gone over, there was more quality than not, believe it or not. And that's me saying that I'm not a big fan of DC Silver Age. Ugh, we're not going to go into that. But anyway, I digress. This is where we meet Fabian Nikesia. Well, not Fabian Nikesia. That is the writer. Fabian Cortez. <laughs> and he's basically saying, Trust in me, my lord. It must be conched in the terms of those flat scans, understand? Flat scans. Those genetic dead ends, unblessed with your mutant abilities. What terms, Cortez, do you suggest? Whew. You can kind of see how Magneto starts to kind of slip back into his old ways. The X-Men try to come to him as friends, especially Rogue. Been a while, Magneto. Never called, never wrote. I was starting to figure you'd forgotten all about me. That's no way for friends to act. Hello, Rogue. You raise this wreck out of the kindness of your heart, Mags. Figured maybe you'd give these sailor boys a decent burial or what? I sunk Leningrad as an act of self-defense, Wolverine. I resurrected for the same reason. But he gets a wake-up call. And before that happens, just artwork. Ah, God, the artwork's absolutely freaking fantastic. And you can see why this book is still one of those ones that's just going to go down the annals of time as a great book. Magneto ends up in the shipwreck. And then when I was talking about great writing, listen... Some died in a blinding instance as the hull collapsed and the sea rushed in to claim their lives. Others in the compartments which didn't rupture faced the slower obliviation of asphyxiation. All this time he'd thought about them in astra abstract ponds instead of men. Now, though, at last he finds himself face to face with the consequences of his actions. And he remembers another time, other bodies, Bones still coated with the flesh of families and friends tossed into a lime-soaked pit, and him along with them. Only he was still alive. Somehow he clawed his way to the surface. So even before he can have that moment of self-reflection, he flees. Rogue tries to reason with him. Something happens. And there's just all these moments of, what is it called? A series of unfortunate events that starts to push Magnus back to the man that we know. He's sitting there in pain. I thought my armor proof against any assault. On the other hand, I suppose I should have been grateful I prevented an X-Men's claws from cutting deeper. There was no hesitation in him. No mercy. Had I not withdrawn from the field of combat, he would not have stopped until one of us was slain. Why then has he turned on me? What has changed? Why must blood always come between me and the others? <coughs> so you can see all these different emotions that Magneto's having. So he's just not this blatant villain that he was when first introduced. He has gone through several different gauntlets of his life and he's not sure how to come to terms with himself like Xavier has and that's again we're going to go off on a little tangent here but that's why I hate that Xavier nowadays is always the villain always the villain always the villain always the villain the road to hell paved with good intentions it's it's overdone him being the yin, yin to Magneto's yang has always been one of the, the cruxes of X-Men and so when they both start to kind of lean together, like Krakoa, it sort of kills that that um, duplicity. And here you can see where Magneto's finally kind of made up his mind on what he wants to do. And this is where we get the villain Magneto once again. Now, in terms of storytelling, I'm fine with it. Because it's taken Magneto on this long journey from supervillain to ally to sort of misunderstood kind of anti-hero to a degree that will do things that Charles Xavier would not do, which is why Onslaught to a degree is interesting, which we'll talk about at another time. <sighs> this is the era of X-Men that I miss. 
and I'm so glad that I have all the connecting covers. Um, I did not want to take my copy that I have signed by Jim Lee off my wall to review, so we're just going to go over this one because, yeah, I don't want to take this one out because, yeah, having that signed by Jim Lee is happy little camper on that regard. <laughs> But yeah, if you guys can get your hands on these, I'm I'm sure that over the years these are going to start climbing again. There for a while they were dollar bins, but um, I think people are starting to understand why the X-Men are so special again. And that makes me happy because I've been a fan of them for years and years. And to be able to go back through this book again makes for a really great time. So if you've enjoyed what you've seen, please first and foremost support your local comic shop or wherever it is like to get your action figures and comics and grab this book while you can or collect the trades. However, just make sure to grab it and read it. And if you've enjoyed this review, really would appreciate if you take a moment to like, share, and subscribe. Helps the channel more than you could possibly know. And if you don't mind hitting that fancy the asteroid M bell next subscribe, that way as I continue to pull content, you guys get notified. Come to the channel and I love talking with you on hearing your thoughts and feedback down in the comments below or the socials, which I'll make sure the links down in the description. So with all that said, hope you all continue to have an absolutely amazing day reading and happy hunting, everyone.